now. And you can see that up top. And so just to let everybody know that their image is being recorded and may be posted in a public venue or on a public venue. So if you would like to stay silent and or black out your screen, please do so. Um, if you would not, if you would prefer to remain anonymous because we are recording this for posterity's sake. And um, this is the first Colaverse of the spring semester. Um, we've been running these discussions, series, events since, well, the pandemic started last spring. Um, and this is our first of this semester, but we hold them on the last Thursday of every month. And I want to talk a little bit in, to introduce you a little bit right now to Hiram Sims, who is our guest um, speaker for today's event. And I'm going to read a little bit of his bio for us to start. Born and raised in various parts of Los Angeles, Hiram Sims is a poet, essayist, and professor of creative writing, teaching at the Los Angeles Film School and USC with the Community Literature Initiative, um, which he's gonna talk about, I think, a little bit today, which he founded. Uh, he graduated from the University of Southern California and received a BA in English and Creative Writing and a master's degree in professional writing in poetry. In addition to teaching essay writing, creative writing, and literature, he is the founder of the Urban Poets Society. He has published three collections of poetry, including Poems of a Young Troubled Mind, Write or Die, an anthology of poetry, which is from the Urban Poets Workshop, and Photoetry, which is hard to say, I practiced that. <laughs> Photoetry, Poetry and Photography from South Central. And so please welcome Hiram Sims. Hey, thank you all for having me. And um, I'm going to just talk just for about 20 minutes um, and then we'll get into the discussion portion. And I'm um, just trying to time myself here, make sure I uh, don't talk too much. You know, like us teachers, we talk for a living, right? So, you know, we gotta try to uh, keep it brief sometimes. So, um, as uh, Linda said, my name is Hiram Sims. I'm an author, I'm a poet, I'm a, a, a husband. I have six children under the age of 11, and uh, all of them are beautiful, wonderful, active children who love to, you know, eat up all our food and tear up our house. And, uh, you know, we're just raising a family and uh, excited about you know, all the things that we get to do uh, with them. But today I'm here to talk about building your dreams during a crisis, right? Because that's something that uh, I was able to do and uh, my wife uh, helped me to do and uh, just other people around, I've seen them doing this, you know, like starting on things that they've wanted to do for a long time. And instead of seeing limitations imposed by COVID, they see opportunities, you know, that are given by COVID. So that's the point of my discussion today is just to, to talk about how that happened for me and then to talk a little bit about a process that I feel like is important um, to consider when you are uh, trying to work on a dream while there's lots and lots of problems going on around you. Uh, so the first thing I just want to talk to you about is like how the Sims Library of Poetry began. Um, it began in a suitcase and uh, I can um, share screen real quick and show you a picture of that suitcase. I think I have screen share capability. Um, yeah. So this is a picture of the suitcase. Um, I was teaching for the Community Literature Initiative, which is a program that I created at USC for writers of color to write and publish books. And so one of the requirements for my class is that the students had to read a book of poetry every single week. And my students were not doing that. 
And I told them like, why aren't you doing it? And they were like, oh, you know, getting access to books of poetry is harder than you think. Like my local library has none or different things they would tell me. So what I decided to do was put 80 of my own poetry books in that suitcase and I dragged it into the classroom. And then at the end of class, I'd open it up and I would say, you know, take a book or put one back and get another one. And then the students started to read, you know, these poetry books. And um, one of my students said, you know, this is this is the suitcase. This is the little Sims library of poetry, huh? And I was like, yeah, that, that sounds good. Um, so uh, that's what we called it, you know, for a little, little while. And uh, soon after that, uh, I learned uh, how to build a bookshelf. I was playing in the backyard with some scrap wood, and then I built a bookshelf. And then I looked at my empty garage after it was done. I was like, I could build a, a wraparound bookshelf. And I grew up uh, building things with my father, who was a, a contractor. So, um, you know, to him, it was like light work. <laughs> but to me, it was like, a huge deal, right? To be able to build a bookshelf that wrapped around one half of the garage. And so once I built the bookshelf, and uh, this was in uh, the summer of 2019, um, or 2018, sorry. Um, one of the things that that transpired is once I put my 300 books of poetry on these big shelves, it looked really little. It looked like there was only five books on the bookshelf. So I had a birthday coming up and I said, I'll, I'm gonna have a birthday party and uh, ask all of my poetry friends to come and donate books to this library of poetry that were opening in the garage. And so then, then I saw other things, right? I started going to local libraries and asking them like, what parts of the library do people actually use? And they were like, they primarily use the computer lab. So we built a little computer lab with three computers on it. And, and then I said, what else happens here that people actually come to? And they said, there's events that happen here at the library. So uh, we built a stage in our backyard. And so on my birthday, on July 6th, you know, like the stage was there. You know, we could fit like 40 people in the backyard. And then we also had our little computer lab. And, um, you know, at the beginning of that day, all these poets showed up, right? Poets that are like, I mean, legends in our community. Kamal Daoud, who started the world stage, Peter J. Harris, Connie Williams, just like the list goes on and on. And by the end of that day, so we started off with 300, which were my books. At the end of the day, we had about 2,000 books of poetry there, right? So about out of the three shelves, two of them were entirely full, just off people bringing their own 10 books, five books, eight books, right? We had built a library. And, um, the, and I was so happy to see it, right, come to life. And we had a show, people read poetry, and so, you know, but I had originally had a vision for a library that was much bigger uh, than my garage. And then having a library in your garage comes with problems, right? The number one problem is that, you know, my landlord lived next door and she didn't want random people just walking into my backyard, right? So she was a little bit nervous about it. She didn't say I couldn't do it, but she was like weary about it then, you know, like people need to use a bathroom. And so on that first day, my wife was very kind to let people, you know, like in the house to use the bathroom. She's so sweet, you know, like, but I thought, you know, like afterward it was like, we don't just want random people coming in the house. So first I was like, maybe we can get a porta potty in the backyard. That looks weird. And, or just like a bucket in the corner. But we were like, you know, uh, eventually, we want to move into um, a different space. And so at the beginning, um, I was very inspired by Booker T. Washington's book, uh, Up From Slavery. And uh, he taught me, you know, how he 
built an institution, which was with the labor of his students. You know, like at the beginning of the day, you know, they would have class, right, for four hours. And then in the second half of the day, they would build buildings, you know, like um, literally. And when he first got Tuskegee University, it and they said, you're the president of this university, uh, go to Tuskegee and you'll find it. And he, you know, pulled up and it was a hundred acres of farmland, nothing on it, not one building. And by the time he died, they had built 37 buildings, uh, him and his students. And I just thought that was amazing. So I was just like, me and my students are going to have to build this library if it's going to make it out of my garage one day. And so I told the students and they said, we're on board. So we started, this is probably like September, right? So we're like, I, I told them at the beginning of the year, like our goal this year, you're going to write a book and publish a book and together we're going to move the library into a public space. So once a month, we would talk about it a little bit. Some people started looking for spaces, looking for things for rent, you know, that we could. So they would sometimes, you know, text me, email me pictures like, hey, what do you think about this? And, you know, I wasn't very proactive about it. And then in January, uh, the third week of January 2019, I got sick. Um, I was actually, I had just taught a class at the LA Film School, creative writing class. And uh, I went to a staff meeting and in that staff meeting, I started hyperventilating. And uh, I called 911, uh, the ambulance came and got me. It was like during the first, the first news stories about the coronavirus, right? And um, so I went to the hospital and I was in the emergency room for 24 hours. Like it was so crowded at Hollywood Presbyterian Hospital. And then they told me, um, you know, that you have pneumonia, which, which I now know was COVID, right? They said, you have pneumonia and we're gonna keep you. And so um, I was in the hospital for seven days. I've never been hospitalized in my life. So like, it was a very like, strange experience and so while i'm in the hospital bed there's a man next to me and he's on a ventilator and uh i'm pretty sure he was dying and uh i've because he did not get out of that bed one time in all seven of those days not once did he get up to go to the bathroom and he had a 24-hour nurse with him you know to monitor his breathing which was which was terrible and so you know, I was one day I was praying in there and I was like, you know, God, I've done a lot of things that I wanted to do, like live a very blessed life, got a great family, wife, children. I got to go to college, you know, like I've written some things like, but if you let me out of here, <laughs> I'm going to open up that library of poetry. So let me out of here. And so, you know, God was like, okay. So uh, seven days later, I walked out and I, you know, it took me another week or two before I could walk and breathe regularly, you know, and then I told my students, like, let's do it. Like, let's not forget that we wanted to do that. And then uh, maybe three months later, uh, my wife, uh, she had a, a, a preschool in a building on Florence and she we were sitting on the couch and she was like, you know, um, the pandemic is, you know, making me have to close the school. She couldn't have kids at the preschool. And uh, so she was like, how about you move your library from my garage into that building, which is about 2000 square feet. Uh, and it had office space, a kitchen, outdoor space, just like a big room for where the book stacks would go. And you know, I was just like, at, at first I was like, it, that doesn't quite, it didn't quite compute, you know, that it could work. And then maybe like 20 minutes later, I was like, yes, like I, I started to see it, right? Like where things would go and all that. So I really owe it to her. She's here today um, in this session or was in this session. Uh, no, she's here. 
And uh, she, she put a picture actually of us in the backyard on, on day one uh, as her screensaver. So, uh, so the library is really a, a, an, a gift from her. And so she was just like, you can move in and you could take over the bills and you know, you could, you could have it there. And so I told my students and then it was at the end of the semester, but we got to work. And so the students, um, you know, put their shoulder to the wheel and we started transferring books, carrying books, um, got a lot of volunteer help. And then they came and we uh, moved into the space. So this, uh, this third picture down here is a picture of the main room, which holds our 5,000 books of poetry. This is me and my wife in front of the library. And then we got a, uh, a picture of a, 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 a blue piano outside. And then these cubbies are brand new books of poetry, you know, from my uh, publishing class students that, that people can buy. And so we have, in the library, we have an individual poet section. We got periodicals, anthologies, children's book, uh, CLI alumni, and then we got a, a shelf of African American writers and a shelf of Latino writers, CD collection, DVDs, all of that. And I put out a call, you know, when we were open and said, hey, we're, we're creating a bigger library of poetry. Can poets, can you all uh, bring books? And this time the call went a little farther. And so people started donating books from other cities, you know, Ventura, San Diego. Then they started donating books from other states. We started to get books from Chicago and some books from Texas and individual writers just sending signed copies of their own books. And so, you know, I would say these other 3,000 books that we got is primarily poets, you know, who either donated books or donated money for books. And I just thought, you know, that uh, there was, there used to be a clothing brand called FUBU, right? Which standed for, for us, by us, right? And that's how I think about the library. The library is created by poets uh, with the individual collections of poets. And together, our individual collections form a library. And so we have a uh, private writing room, performance space, you know, all these, all these cool things. So that's, that's the process of how uh, the library um, began. And so I just want to talk about two more things. One, I want to talk about a process by which people can work uh, on their dreams during the COVID, you know, pandemic. Uh, first, I want to talk about like the value of your thoughts, right? And so I read a book by Wallace D. Waddles called The Science of Getting Rich. And he talked about how every single thing that exists around you, if, if all of you look around your room, right, just, just look around, every single thing around you uh, was a thought at one point. It existed in someone's mind. And if that is true, that then the thoughts that we have, the visions that we have are incredibly valuable. And in our society, we, we tend to value what is tangible over thoughts. But his book says that you should value thoughts over what is tangible because the thoughts are a precursor to what is tangible. So, I thought that that was very powerful, right? Just valuing that, uh, valuing the thoughts that you have and also pinpointing poisonous thoughts, right? Some of those thoughts being, I can't do it. I don't have the money to do it. I don't have the help to do it. I don't have the time to do it. All of these thoughts really work against you, right? It's like, they're like a flesh eating disease. And so I find that there, there are really only three thoughts that help us, you know, work on these dreams that we have. The first one is, I want to do it. You know, like I have a desire to do it. The second thought is, uh, I'm going to do it. And the third thought is, I need some help to get it done, right? <laughs> Those are the only three thoughts that I wanna have relative to whatever goal I'm working on, 
right? And almost every other thought is not helping me, right? Those three thoughts, I wanna do it, I'm going to do it, and I need some help to get it done, right? Um, so, so that's kind of like the thought part, right? And then, you know, like after I get past the thought, once I'm kind of clear on what, what the desire is, then, you know, that's when I start praying, you know, like, because to me, you know, uh, you know, asking God for it is, you know, like at, at the foundation of it, you know, like, I know many of us have, some of us have different faiths. Some of us, you know, believe in the universe. Some of us believe in, you know, uh, you know, some of us are atheists, but, you know, uh, I just found that there was, you know, there was one piece of writing that I thought was such a great linear process, right? And that's when Jesus said, ask and it shall be given, seek and it shall be find, found, knock and it shall be opened unto you. So when I first heard that as a kid, I actually thought that all three of those were the same thing. But what I have found in my life is that I think he was kind of given a three-step process there, right? Like first is the asking. And I feel like that's what we do when we're praying is mostly we're asking, but I think asking the right source, like, you know, the, who, who it actually belongs to, you know, like if, if my, if my, if I put food in my refrigerator, you know, like for my children, you know, I, I, I created it for them, but I want them to ask me, you know, <laughs> and then they get it right. I don't want them to, I don't want them to ask the refrigerator, you know, like, <laughs> you know, like just, you know, I, I created it for you. So ask me. And I think that's, I think the same way about dreams. I think dreams are a gift. They're given, you know, and, but I think, you know, God wants us to ask for it, you know? So, and then the seeking, to me, that's about like going after it, like putting some actual actions behind your request, you know, and then eventually you're going to arrive, you know, at it, you know, there might be some roadblocks and, and then you have to knock, right? Then you have to, you know, knock repeatedly. Sometimes the door don't open the first time and you got to bang on the door and scream so so you can get some access. And I think with, with everything that I've ever wanted to do there was always someone who had to like open the door give permission you know you know you guys are at a university you know like you you filled out the application you you know you got your grades your, your high school transcripts but you're like somebody has to open the door and say you know like you're admitted right so so to me like that that's a three-step process ask seek and knock you know so, so I feel like after I ask, right, then I'm, I'm trying to find the process by which this thing is made. And that's where I think going to get help is important. There's a book I'm going to put in the chat. I'm going to talk for like four more minutes. Uh, there's a book called uh, The E-Myth. And this book changed my life. The E-Myth by Michael... E. Gerber. Um, and any of you who want to start a business uh, or something kind of large, I think you should read this book because the book is about building a team, right? And it's about going and asking the people that have already done it. And I feel like that's a really foundational part of working on your dreams, even during a crisis, is that there's someone who's who already did it. Like, of course, at first I thought I was the first person <clears throat> to ever want to create a library of poetry, right? I was like, oh, that's never been done before. And then I Googled it, right? <laughs> There's a library of poetry in Chicago. There's a library of poetry in New York. There's a library of poetry in Florida. There's a library of poetry in Canada. There's a library of poetry in uh, England, right? I'm, they're probably 50 more all over the world, right? So I'm not the first. So I started reaching out to those people and just asking them how they did it. And they started giving me advice and giving me a roadmap. 
right? And so after, you know, I got more understanding of the process, then I start asking for help, you know? And, uh, and so the, the E-Myth teaches you about the, the necessary parts of a organization, of a business, and all of us have probably occupied one of these positions before, but, you know, typically you got like facilities, they clean and all that. You got marketing, sales, you got, you know, like the product development, whoever creates it. So I learned about the staff of a library. And so I went from, in, in CLI in general, because CLI is an umbrella nonprofit, I went from having one part-time employee to now 26 people who work for CLI, either as part-time workers or volunteers or interns like Joshua Jones, right? Fantastic young brother who's helping us out. But that book taught me about just being resourceful. Um, and so the last thing is just to like get started immediately, like start where you are you know like i wanted a library i started by going to ross and buying a 19 dollars suitcase right that's where i started and then <clears throat> i moved on to you know a garage and then and then you know i moved on to this building me and my wife and so i just find that every, you know everybody wants to be grown but few people want to grow right and so to me that's a super important part of it like starting where you are sometimes i think we're bsing ourselves like about the things that we want you know you know sometimes you be like okay i want to lose 30 pounds and i'm just gonna like i'm gonna start tomorrow <laughs> like i'm gonna i'm gonna go I'm gonna, I'm gonna eat a pizza tonight that'll be my last pizza forever <laughs> and then it's straight salads and rice cakes from then on right so i just find that if you really have the energy like start right now you know like whatever you can do draw it out you know because i feel like writing things down drawing them out you know it's about it's not just about a blueprint it's about literacy it's about i define literacy as several people's ability to read and comprehend one thing, right? So sometimes we have these ideas that other people cannot read, you know, like they don't understand it. So if we are able to, you know, write it down and uh, draw it out, then people can, other people can see it and then they can tell you what you need to create, what you're trying to create right uh 60 more seconds uh last thing i want to talk about is like pandemic opportunities like opportunities that i feel like were created by the pandemic at least in the context of the library one is like covid money that was given out by the federal government the state and the city of la so um the sba gave out a lot of uh, loans and grants that's like very easy to get, like incredibly easy to get. In comparison to writing a grant, it was like, what's your name? What's your address? Like, how much money do you want? Here you go. <laughs> like, it was very easy to get if you have a, a you know, a business, like a business that exists already in any small form right um so there's so much so many grants being given by the city the county and the state and the federal government um the the other resource is workers from around the world so all of us work from home now right so you know like whereas workers used to used to have to come in and i'd be like oh man i don't think i can you know get somebody or pay somebody to come in um everybody works from home whether they're volunteers or interns or they get paid so for some reason there are more people willing to help and work if they can work from home so the pandemic i feel like really created lots of opportunity in that digital space 
learning how to use Asana and other software for like team building tasks that can be done remotely. And, you know, learned how to use Facebook and Instagram and all that. So to promote the library and get support. And last thing, there's a lot of space that was not available before that is now available because other businesses have moved out of spaces and the price of rental space has dropped, you know, like commercial rental space. So if you want to, you know, open up a bakery or what a beauty, like whatever you want to create, like I drive all up and down the street and I see for lease signs everywhere. Right. And I think that the pandemic has created, you know, like a drop in just the access that it would take to, to, to get, to get a space, you know, um, there are some office spaces by a company called Regis and you could, you can get an actual office for like $250 a month and you could be in there every day or three days a week in a very nice office building with a secretary, right? They like, you can act like the secretary is yours at the front desk, you know, like, but yeah. So that's, that's really what I wanted to talk about, you know, just like understanding uh, the process, you know, that, that I feel like works and then what opportunities the pandemic has actually produced that we could take advantage of. Cause we still pay rent, you know, at the library, the rent didn't go away, but the pandemic, you know, gave us or helped us to get some resources, you know, to, you know, to, to pay the rent for a year, you know, while we built the place inside. Okay. I'm well, I'm glad you mentioned Josh, because I do want to bring Josh Jones into this discussion a little bit. Josh, yeah, there you are. If you just want to take a couple minutes and real briefly talk to us, tell us about the internship you're doing at, at the Sims Library of Poetry. Sure. So I'm very thankful um, to have met Hiram. I met Hiram through Mike Sangsoon right here. Um, and the internship is a blessing in the fact that it is right up the street from my house, literally. It's on, um, as Hiram mentioned, it's on Florence. So it's like Florence and Fifth. And so I can go straight up Fifth from my house and be there in the matter of minutes if I'm taking a car, um, like three minutes. And if I'm walking, it takes a little bit longer. But anyway, um, I'm working presently um, as a library intern. So I catalog and um, I'm trying to help get books and donations and such. So when I first started out, um, it was cataloging books and then also thinking about different ways and different tools that we can um, implement into the um, library to make things easier. Because at first we were doing things like manually in a sense, like we had the website set up, but it's just like you had to um, kind of like put it in there a certain way with the ISBN and stuff like that. So like researching and doing stuff with the other interns to find out like, hey, is there a way we can like scan this and do it faster? So like that happened. And then just um, like presently, we're um, working on trying to uh, create events like um, biweekly poetry um, workshops and stuff like that. So coordinating with my fellow um, volunteers and interns to get that done, talking to different poets that I've met like um, through Mike and stuff like that. And even was thinking about talking to some of the professors who are, have an interest in poetry, um, see if they would um, be willing to help out with that. But just, it really is just, um, it, it's teaching me to one, work and communicate effectively with others and um, learn how different people think and um, relate to the environment that they're in. But then just really humbling, just being a, a poet, being around poets, and seeing like their muse and how they do things and um, using that to help better myself. So it's, um, it's been a very great experience and I'm thankful to um, be a part of it. Thank you, Josh. Um, I really appreciate that Josh approached me and I don't know if what other faculty you've approached that might be here on the screen today or students for that matter, but if you do have books to donate, <laughs> Uh, Josh is willing to facilitate that for you from Woodbury. So um, I'm going to be doing that in a couple of weeks when the campus opens back up. I've got a bunch of Latinx books 
poetry collections uh, that I'm passing along to him for the library. So um, I think that, you know, we'll just open this, the floor up for comments, questions, discussion. Uh, there are some discussion questions that we, that um, Hiram pre-prepared for us. Uh, and maybe one of them I'll toss out, what processes might a person go through to begin or to complete work on a lifelong dream? Um, that was something that Hiram was just sort of beginning to talk to us about, but maybe someone wants to jump in with their own ideas or comments on, on that issue of the process. And of course, questions are always welcome for our speaker. So feel free. Well, hey, I, I sure appreciated hearing from you, Josh and, and Hiram, your, your presentation and your advice uh, it is extremely important. I, I, I wrote down uh, one remark that you made that I, I think I'm gonna remember forever. Having a library in your garage comes with problems. <laughs> <laughs> I, I absolutely love that. And I, I love the spirit that it uh, that you set it in, and and the advice that you uh, you've given us so far. And those those three tenants that to, that you threw out to us, I think, are are super important. I guess especially I relate to that last one. I need help, mm -hmm. and you know, having the the humility to reach out for uh, for help is, um, is is as important as anything. I think. Yes. 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 Yes, and I especially feel like, you know, be, being connected to a university, like we surrounded by ambitious people, you know, like who have dreams of graduating. And, uh, you know, like when I was in college, you know, I was struggling. I was on academic probation my first semester just because I refused to seek out help, you know. And then my advisor was like, you know, you should go you should go to the writing center. You should go get some tutoring at the math center. You know, like, so when I humbled myself and when it got that help, you know, my grades went up and, you know, um, things got so much better for me, you know, because I, because I just learned, you know, to, to seek out the help. So I, I'm with you on that. But I'm gonna just follow up on that because, um... You know, because universities need help to be their best selves too, mm. and uh, and I know we do at Woodbury, and I, I think that's the case with any institution, and uh, and so I I always hope that we have the uh, the humility to to reach out to to people that can help us be the best that we can. Absolutely. I'm going to jump in because reaching out for help has been like something I think, especially for myself, like as a student right now is so hard, especially with COVID. It's like just doing it. I found myself always being somebody that's like, I can learn how to do this. And so I don't need anybody else. I can literally do this myself. And then meeting people along the way that are like, I'm really good at marketing. I'm really good at graphic design. I'm, you know, I coordinate and all this stuff. Um, I think COVID has like sat me down and gave me that reality check of there's people around you that know how to do stuff that you want to learn and you can just ask them. And we really like have all the time in the world right now to just like hop on Zoom and learn. So I think, I think like the silver lining of COVID has given me the opportunity to sit down with that last, I, I'm going to call these mantras because I'm going to remember them as mantras for myself, but learning how to ask for help and then just doing it because I think learning asking for help is such a scary thing when you're somebody that you have this dream in mind and you're so scared to figure out how to start it because the first thing you think of is what if it doesn't work mm -hmm. and so I think just throwing yourself out there is probably the best thing especially right now with COVID like the worst thing anyone can say is no and you don't even have to see them in person anymore truth 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 and uh you know there's something that i found out that i did not know and I, not only did i not know it i didn't believe it right i did not believe that there are people who wanted to help me create what i was creating 
you know, like, and one of my former students told me about a website called volunteermatch.com. And we started posting ads on volunteer match, like, Hey, we need an administrative assistant. I mean, probably 48 people said, I would like to be your administrative assistant at the library for free 20 hours a week. Right. We need an, we need a volunteer accountant. We need volunteer uh, librarians to catalog the books. 10 people were like, I'd love to come help you catalog books. What a like, the surprise i'm still surprised by that i'm like you want to come and catalog books for fun like that's what you like to do <laughs> after you get off work but but people do want to help and they they do want to contribute you know to things that they believe in you know th things that will help them to grow and learn yeah sharice you look like you was gonna say something <laughs> I was. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm Sharice. I was just going to say that um, I, I can personally attest to the fact that Hiram definitely does what he preaches. And when he says, write it down, he means that. And anytime I, I'm his wife, by the way, come to him with an idea, that's always the first thing he tells me is write it down. Um, but one thing that I really admire about what I've witnessed in watching Hiram is he really does just start where he can and i think that that's no we're not going anywhere babe that's placed evidence um by seeing the suitcase you know i actually didn't even know that sims library started in a suitcase until after they started building the actual building i thought the start was in our garage um but that's one thing i've seen him do time and time again is just starting with whatever it is that you have and sometimes starting with whatever it is that you have looks like the idea and writing that down and i think a lot of times we get imitate intimidated by the vision of what we have and feeling like we don't have enough of what we need to start it um, but literally once you start and just put energy behind it you see it start to form and you see people start to rally behind it and Hiram you might be able to share with us what it was because you introduced me to this and I don't remember where we read it or watched it but there was somebody who talked about starting to build something and uh, being like in the dirt and playing around in the dirt and somebody walking by and being like what are you doing and, and them saying like I'm building a house and that other people who are watching them play in the dirt look at what they're doing and say like no you're not building a house but once you're able to draw an actual blueprint then people can see what's in your mind and they can see what it is that you're starting to do so i just i love the concept of just just starting and um you know being able to show others what your vision is is a skill that you can work on and build but it definitely starts with writing it down because once you write it down someone can read it and either say oh i get this and i want to back it or like i don't quite see the vision yet i don't quite see what it is and sometimes that's even a great starting point is just your ability to communicate and share your vision with others and get that feedback on whether or not you're adequately sharing that vision to get the support that you need uh thank you sharice and one thing that you your comments reminded me of is like it's sort of uh, something that becomes a, it feels like a problem, but like dreams will fight with each other. You know, like they will fight for your attention and one of them will be like, you should do this. And then your mind will be like, no, but you wanted to do that. Remember you wanted to make an album and then you wanted to build a house. And then you, then you want to, you want to build a library too. And then you wanted to like, they start like, you know, they start clashing, you know, and I, that's I, I, I just like I tell my children, like, don't fight with each other. I love you all. <laughs> and I'm, I'm going to get to all of you. I promise. Like, I, I be saying that to my goals, too. Like, I've had a major, like, just mental bout. Should, like, should I build this library first or should I build a house for my family first? Like, you know, like this back and forth. Oh, your family's more important. Like, you need a place to like you need a place to live. You need like that should be that should come before a library. Right. But then I had to remind myself, like, just, just dreams, just get in line, you know, like, and I'll, I'll get to you. So I have to piggyback off of that and then I'll leave y'all alone. But also with that, I think our dreams sometimes are like our children and we can dream about having children and then we have the children and we can give them all the things that they need, but our children will show us exactly who they are. 
Like, I'm not going to decide that my child is going to be a doctor or going to be an artist. My child is going to grow up and show me exactly what she is. And I think sometimes we have these dreams and they are babies when we first have them and then we birth them and they kind of grow and they may turn into something greater than what we even dreamed. And I share that because one of my um, friends is a creator of a TV show. And she actually told me that when she first set out to create this, she wanted to make a coffee table book. She wanted to make a coffee table book highlighting couples and highlighting love. And so she started out interviewing people and she just had a little tape recorder. And then as she interviewed people, it just evolved into then video interviews and then it evolved into an amazing docu-series. So she never saw it as a docu-series. She saw it as a book, but the dream itself kind of grew up and evolved into something else, of course, with help and support of people around her. And she said that, you know, she met someone and that was the catalyst who really helped her to move the dream forward. But so I think, yeah, I think like everything you said, Hiram, asking, writing it down, seeking support, and, and the people that support us really act as catalysts for our dream and our you know, our dreams are the seeds and we can plant them. And then when we start telling people about it, when we start writing it down and asking people, that's us watering the seed. And these other people come along and they have like the nutrients and all the resources and all these things to help our, our dreams grow into these things that sometimes we see them becoming a certain something. And sometimes they grow past what we ever imagined them being. Other comments or questions? Comments, questions? I just want to have, I have a comment. Okay. Um, first, thank you for sharing. And um, when you first started sharing about the 80 books in the suitcase, it didn't make me think of myself, but it made me think of my son who um, has his, uh, degree, his master's, but he has this side passion about going into black hair. Um, and he started doing barbering when he went away to school as a, a way to just kind of keep his own self trimmed and then help out his buddies. But we, he literally, since this pandemic hit, he purchased two barber chairs. He doesn't get anything brand new. He either gets it, get a hand me down or someone gives it to him and he calls it garage cut. He cuts his frat brother's hair. He does things like that. And at first for me, I'm like your wife with him having people that need to use the restroom. Like, no, nope, not during a pandemic. <laughs> We're behind the garage. But anyway, I just, it, it, made me, it made me see something larger. You know, that this is something he has as a side kick or a side dream. And it's his dream. And as your wife so eloquently put it, I'm got to let him let it grow and um, see what it turns into. Who knows? You know, it might might be helpful for mama later in her retirement. But anyway, I appreciate your, your story. I appreciate you sharing that because it, it helped me to look at um, how to process things that he's, he's involved in. And I appreciate that. Yeah, Hiram, um, as Lisa just said here, I appreciate how, you know, you've always been about the immediate in the moment. And you know, we have so many mutual friends and, and we, you know, we, you and I have been talking about poetry for coming up on nine, 10 years now. You know, when I, I first met you at, was it Cal State LA at the open mic? Ooh, could have been, could have been. 2011, 2012 or 2011. Mm -hmm. But um, you always are a man in the moment making things happen. And, um, and, and I love that. And it is inspiring to, for people to look around and, and, and see what the resources they have around them and, and make the most out of what you have right where you are in that moment. And um, your library is, is a perfect example of that and just how it's all manifested. And thank you for inspiring me about Booker T. Washington too, because I read his book cover to cover and um, such a, such a, you know, a humble man, but he did so much really, really incredible. Yes. He inspires me so much every day. Every day I'm inspired by his work, yeah. And so Hiram's gonna 
read a poem for us as a way to close out our time with him today. So um, I'm looking forward to this. Yeah, all this talk about poetry, right? Gotta, gotta have some poetry at the end. So um, um, at the Library of Poetry, we have what's called a dream tour. It's something that we're developing, but it's basically a QR code tour where you have these codes all over the uh, building to where you could take your phone and put it on the QR code and then the video pops up of the author reading their own uh, poem to you, but they're all poems about dreams, right? And so the first, I'm gonna read one short one and one that's a little bit longer. The first one is called, uh, it's something my, it's a poem my daughter used to recite to me, Naomi. And, uh, you know, this is coming out of her, it was just so beautiful. And it's a Langston Hughes poem. And we have a mural outside with it. And it says, uh, hold fast to dreams, for when dreams die, life is a broken winged bird that cannot fly. Hold fast to dreams, for when dreams go, life is a barren field frozen in snow. And every time I read that, I'm like, yes, like, that's it. Like, it's about your ability to hold on to the dream over time. And we, we got this t-shirt that we sell called Hold the Vision Over Time, right? And to me, uh, some people look at the fact that they've had this dream for so long uh, as a sort of knock against them, right? I've wanted to do this for five years and I haven't done it. But to me, like that's, that's the ownership of dreams is like, is having them over a period of time, right? So this last one, uh, someone donated books to the library. We got them in the mail and there was a book of poetry uh, from 1947. You know, we got some old, we got some classic stuff at the library. We got one book from 1895, some Paul Lawrence Dunbar, but this particular book was from 1897. And like, I just opened it and this is the first poem that I opened to. Um, and I just wanna show you and read it to you. It's called, the dreams ahead. Never seen this book. I just literally cracked it open. This was the first poem. And it says, what would we do in this world of ours were it not for the dreams ahead? For thorns are mixed with the blooming flowers, no matter which path we tread. And each of us has his golden goal stretching far into the years. And ever he climbs with a hopeful soul with alternate smiles and tears. That dream ahead is what holds him up through the storms of a ceaseless fight when his lips are pressed to the wormwood's cup and clouds shut out the light. To some, it's a dream of high estate. To some, it's a dream of wealth. To some, it's a dream of a truce with fate and a constant search for health. To some, it's a dream of home and wife. To some, it's a crown above. The dreams ahead are what make each life the dreams and faith and love. The Dreams Ahead by Edwin Litzy. All right, that's it for me. Thank you. Thank you all for listening. I'll turn it back over to you, Linda. Great Thank job, Hiram. Yeah, that was lovely. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Josh, for joining us today. Thank you both for speaking. Um, about the library and your experiences there and the process and creating it for the community. Um, thank you all for coming. Uh, I thank Ruben and the administration for the support for the series. And Lisa and Rachel both left already, but I thank them <laughs> for their help um, in making this happen. And I hope y'all come back. Thank you for joining us. I appreciate it. And good night. Thank you all. Thank you. To be continued, Hiram. Everybody have a good night. Hi, guys. <laughs>